the cloud. All right. Well, uh, welcome, folks. Thanks for joining us on this uh, um, uh, rainy or potentially snowy evening, depending on where you're at uh, in November. Uh, this is another instantiation of Intersectionality Talks, which is a digital lecture series at Plymouth State University that focuses on intersectional approaches to literature and culture. Um, tonight's chat is special in that we are also co-sponsored by the uh, Center for Diversity, Equity, and Social Justice at PSU and our local chapter of the American Association of University Professors, which is a bargaining unit for our tenure track faculty here at PSU. Uh, if you, uh, and I'll, uh, well, th I'll throw the link in the chat just in, in case anybody wants to look at the, the, the full event description. Uh, today's chat is entitled, It's Not Free Speech. We have with us uh, Professor Michael Barabe and Professor Jennifer Ruth. Um, Michael is the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Literature at Pennsylvania State University, and Jennifer is Associate Dean in the College of the Arts and Professor in the School of Film at Portland State University. So at some point tonight, we will get confused about PSU, I'm sure. Um, very confused about PSU. Um, because we all go by PSU, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll have. To, I'm sure it'll happen at least once. Um, they're here tonight to talk to us about their uh, recent 2022 book from Johns Hopkins University Press, entitled "It's Not Free Speech: Race, Democracy, and the Future of Academic Freedom." Love that cover. Um, and it, it, there are a lot of really interesting things for us to talk about in relationship to this book, especially in a, I think, a New Hampshire context context, we've had our own uh, divisive laws passed at the state legislature level for K through 12. They haven't hit higher ed yet, although there's been attempts to expand them that way. Um, and there's just like a real chilling effect from those that are creating lots, a lot of ripple effects that we're trying to talk through and think through and in, in shared governance ways and ways that y'all have uh, written about. Um, so, uh, just a, a note to our, uh, our our guests and everybody uh, listening. The way we normally do these intersectionality talks is just sort of like a loose interview format with uh, like a chat between me and, and our guests. Um, since we've got a small group tonight, I would encourage you, like if you've got a question in the first half, feel free to use the chat, feel free to raise your hand. Um, but the goal is to spend probably, it's 6.06, probably about the next 30 minutes in conversation and then open up to Q&A. Um, so without further ado, um, and we are recording this and this is gonna be made available on, uh, oh, I should note, um, uh, it's special that tonight's uh, uh, talk is co-hosted by the Diversity Center and uh, AAUP because they normally don't, uh, uh, aren't are involved in this program. Always our, uh, our, our intersectionality talks are sponsored by our English program, by the, um, Academic Unit in Humanities, Cultures, and Communications, and by the PSU Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative, which hosts our recording archive and does all of our, of our um, publicity for us. So that's where the recording will be in the future, and that's where you can see future talks. All right, so to dig in, we, the title, It's Not Free Speech. Let's start with the latter part. What is free speech? because y'all spend a lot of time sort of digging into competing definitions, talking about how far it extends. So um, bring bring us up to speed. Michael, I like your ship metaphor. Mm. I think you should offer it up straight yeah, out. Yeah. Okay, so imagine uh, academic freedom being the boat we're all sailing on and free speech being the water that it, that it buoys it up. Uh, one can't, ex we can't exist without it, but it's not the same thing. Free speech, I mean, to go to um, just classical First uh, Amendment jurisprudence, pretty much anything goes as long as it does not, it, it involves imminent incitement of violence, uh, slander, defamation. Uh, what else? I think, I mean, we just had an incident here at Penn State involving the founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McInnes, which actually did generate <clears throat> uh, national headlines for generating violence. 
And every single attorney, you know, that my administration consulted said, well, it's not imminent. And I really do think we should broaden our sense of imminent to include mm -hmm. very likely to occur in the middle of central Pennsylvania if the head of a, an insurrectionary body shows up mm -hmm. to, to troll us. But that's basically it. Uh, I mean, Jennifer and I, uh, as we've said in other contexts, can go out on the street right now, get ourselves a soapbox and warn people about the reign of the underground lizard people. Uh, this is not a random thing. Millions of people believe David Icke's theory about this. But if we did that in the classroom, we'd be pretty much declaring ourselves constitutionally unfit to, be, to teach in a college. <clears throat> so it really, aside from things that involve imminent harm or defamation, it really is anything goes. And that has been, that has only widened in the last 10 years since Citizens United. Uh, <clears throat> One of the terms Jennifer and I learned, like we didn't go to law school, but now we know the term First Amendment Lochnerism, which uh, refers to the Lochner case of the late 19th century, expanding anti-labor law to almost everything. Well, now Citizens United, well, you know, corporate speech is is free speech, mm -hmm. uh, Hobby Lobby, uh, uh, religious speech is free speech. And then in the pandemic, the right of um, uh, religious groups to uh, flout public health is free speech. There was even an attempt to call the January 6th insurrection a free speech event. So that those boundaries are uh, being pushed outward. I noticed further on there's a question about Elon Musk taking over Twitter, uh, but we can get to that, you know, um, if we get to it. But yeah, free, yeah. Speech, free, free speech is a free for all, aside from immediate th threats of harm or defamation. And yeah, if I can be, add, can I, I add? just say it'll be no tragedy if we don't get to Elon Musk. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so the, the only thing that I would add is from this, there's two vantage points in which the importance of distinguishing free speech from academic freedom can be understood. One is the fact that uh, free speech is a free for all and academic freedom is not and that that distinction is not very well understood and that the two are conflated. So one of the things that is interesting about what your example, Michael, about the Proud Boys person is that all these you went to the free speech thing and the way that the lawyers are defending Gavin McInnes's right to speech through insight that that it doesn't breach the incitement to violence thing and you're saying well doesn't it that that needs to be rethought but also what's disturbing to us is the degree so there's the, there's the question about whether we need to rethink the way that free the first amendment stuff is understood given social media given mm -hmm. you know all these things that's one question that's actually not a question that's that's central to our book, but that's one place that everyone is going right now in our culture for good reasons. But the key, mm -hmm. the interesting thing too is I bet you those lawyers that were defending and saying, oh, this isn't exactly an incitement to violence, were actually probably invoking his academic freedom. Because what you see in filing, they, they may or may not have been, but you see it everywhere. You see free speech and academic freedom yoked together mm -hmm. when one really means one or the other. The filing in the Florida uh, lawsuit to try to defend DeSantis's stop woke stuff. There's been two challenges to that. You just, free speech and academic freedom, that's the phrase, just throughout, as if there's no distinction between them. And students have the idea that students have academic freedom. So if the student group right. invites Gavin McInnes, then it's their academic. You know, so these, that's the other way in which, on the one hand, free speech is the default, but, uh, it, but academic freedom keeps getting thrown in there, but people don't understand that actually academic freedom is where you can draw distinctions and it doesn't have to simply be incitement to violence. And so while many people will react to our book saying that we're looking to censor, we're part of the more censorious kind of crowd around free speech, we're not actually going after free speech, we're asking for people to uphold academic freedom and to say the academic freedom is about disciplinary competence and educational value. And right. it's not just about, yeah, you can say it, it's about is does a university community, is this the kind of uh, expansion of knowledge, expansion of you know dis discourse that is of any value to the educational mm -hmm. community? One quick thing, um, Jennifer has clearly been reading the press releases from my president's office, because even though uh, Gavin McInnes' academic freedom wasn't invoked prior to the event, <clears throat> it certainly was afterwards. Right. You know, exactly as Jennifer said, uh, if we uphold free academic freedom, we must uphold this free speech. Well, Jennifer, I haven't heard back from our president, Neely Bendapudi, but when I saw that in the press release, I promptly sent her a copy of this book. <laughs> inscribed very politely saying whatever else you're hearing about that <clears throat> the fallout from that debacle just for the for the record and for the future that event had nothing to do with academic freedom 
nothing yeah. at all. Exactly. Yeah. So let's, so, and, and that was my, my second question, like, you know, it's not free speech, it presumably being academic freedom, what is yeah. academic freedom? And like, so let me reframe that. How far does academic freedom extend? Like, because uh, as, uh, you know, uh, traditionally, this is something that's been like, uh, publicly well-defined and talked about by AAUP's history and something that is applies as a working condition. Uh, can, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Because we uh, like uh, uh, McGinnis, uh, uh, not employed by the university, right? Right. <laughs> like, I mean, there's some people who are arguably proud boys who are employed by universities, but he's not one of them. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the uh, Michael, I'll let you close on this one, and I'll start it. But just to say that one thing that is not well understood and for good reason, it's murky, is the fact that to the degree that academic freedom, so I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from a little bit of an angle, because you're absolutely right that it is AUP that has defined it, and to the degree to which it, there's any kind of general understanding or, or wider uh, understand public understanding of it, it would be through the language of the AUP, because it's in the law and legal discourse, it's nowhere in the Constitution. It's nowhere. It's a special consideration, according to one judge in one case, of the First Amendment. So it's mm -hmm. underneath First Amendment, um, but it's not been well defined in the courts, and the courts can go in ways that the AUP wouldn't agree with on it. And so it's a very, it's very chaotic, which is a, of course very disturbing in our particular moment in history. Um, but yeah, at the AUP in 1915, you know, they said things like, just because the the person who pays the faculty member doesn't get to sit, tell the faculty member what they're saying, right? The mm -hmm. academic freedom is the freedom for you to work within your expertise that your president may not have expertise. The donor may not have that expertise. You have the freedom to say what you want. And a democracy requires academic freedom from its faculty and from its universities of, of higher learning because the you know the Ron DeSantis of the world, the Lauren Bobears of the world, they are not maybe the the very you know cutting edge of knowledge and understanding of very of any range of things. So they shouldn't be determining what our curriculum is. Um, and so, but it doesn't have any legal standing. It and it's certainly it has legal. It has it comes up in various cases, um, but it doesn't have any legal standing that through the AUP. It's been a kind of and this. I, this I'm using this term very very pointedly. It's been a kind of gentleman's agreement, mm. academic freedom. The idea that you can't be a professor who and of astronomy who says that the moon is made of cheese, right? That we understand that there's certain things that are just in, that's incompetence, that's unfitness, that's not free speech. But the way that it's been governed, exercised, understood, uh, yeah, is. It, is it been a gentleman's agreement? And it's been through the way in which we do promote, we do national recruitment for jobs, promotion and tenure. And when you have a sizable proportion of faculty who don't go through those processes of promotion and tenure, et cetera, it becomes, it, it, it gets that much murkier and it becomes, and that's why the conflation of academic freedom of free speech is so easy for even faculty to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I'm gonna add to that is uh, to <clears throat> say that Jennifer added, it was her idea, to draw on Robert Post's distinction between democratic legitimation and democratic competence. So mm -hmm. democratic legitimation is free speech. You need to be able to criticize the government without prior restraint. That is part of what <clears throat> makes uh, public discourse legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, but democratic competence is something else and it relies on, on an idea of faculty expertise. Uh, that is not a stable or a, a a static thing, new fields emerge, say disability studies, or in the work of Joan Scott, uh, <clears throat> going back to the 80s, not only you know, putting, a, putting gender on the agenda for history, but also saying that sometimes uh, a, the, the best way to observe disciplinary norms is to challenge them. So like I say, it's not just uh, fixed for all time what a form of expertise is, but there is such a thing. And recognizing that is crucial to recognizing that distinction between academic freedom and free speech. One other point is that academic freedom is too often construed as an individual right. It's tricky. It is really a corporate right of a class of people who adjudicate each other. 
and vet each other. And I think in a lot of ways, we have lost that sense. <clears throat> um, I actually have been a little bit distracted in the last couple of weeks. We had a, a health event here. So I haven't written down the date of the event that I'm calling the um, Last Refuge of Scholars Academic Freedom Conference at Stanford. Mm -hmm. But uh, pretty much everyone we mentioned in the book is going to be speaking at it because they have been canceled and they need their academic freedom. And this is really, if we were, rewrite, if we were writing an appendix to the book, now that would be that would be the first paragraph right there um Scott alice is there amy wax it happened last weekend or two weekends ago weekend? yeah it already happened i'm sorry i missed it oh, man. but yeah uh, uh scott atlas right amy wax scott atlas i think organized it you know not now ferguson yeah it, it, it's that um and so the idea is that any uh attempt to actually one of the i, I saw one of the questions um someone liked the idea that we pointed out the white supremacist scholarship is bad scholarship. Not that it's harmful. That's not the point. The point is this bullshit. And it needs to be vetted on intellectual grounds rather than on emotive or whatever you cancel culture, blah, blah, blah grounds. That's not the point. The point is that the sell by date on some of these ridiculous ideas has long since expired. And that is what uh, a rigorous conception of academic freedom would uphold. Yeah, I, I I myself I'm a scholar of um, uh, English Renaissance literature, and I love pointing out political ideas from the 1580s and being like, this is just like what such and such senator said two weeks ago. Like, uh, according to experts, here are the experts from the 1580s. Right, right. Uh, that's, that's always a delight. Um, lots of places to go here, but I want to zero in on the contingent faculty portion um, because I think the way y'all talk about academic freedom, the way AAUP talks about academic freedom, like. All faculty are included in this. This is not just for people who are who are fully vested in tenure. Mm -hmm. um, however, as you make clear in the book, and as I think we're, we're all aware, those of us who are aware of, of working conditions, um, the protections of tenure are not equally distributed. Right? Mm -hmm. That they are um, that that, that uh, sorry sorry excuse me. Um, I said the protections of tenure. I mean the protections of academic freedom are not equally distributed. That they they're they're brought in with tenure in a way that creates uh, inequity in the system. Yeah, I mean, that was a, ironically, there is a way in which, not ironically, I guess it's just, it, it makes me a little bit nervous to put this so baldly, but the, the book is saying we have a problem on two fronts with the completion of academic freedom and free speech. The problem on one front is that we're in a culture with social media, with the rise of white nationalism and militia movements, with the weaponization of free speech, and it's being co-opted as a way to sort of bring out these expired ideas, these discredited ideas, and try to, to gain new legitimation for them. We're in this moment where that conflation is very problematic, and it's raising the issue more, more um, urgently an issue that people have been complaining about for years, but it's being raised more urgently now about those tenured faculty who, who want to jump that opportunistic bandwagon in one way or another, or who want to be, you know, it doesn't have to just be with white nationalism and with racist ideas and and uh, it can also and culture war kind of stuff. It can also be those people who are being paid by uh, corporations to talk about climate change in ways that are misleading, mm -hmm. and yet they're doing it with the imprimatur of their university and their degree. So tenured faculty who take advantage of the system and the capital system, you know, whatever, the political system, whatever aspect that they can, the think tanks that give them money um, to to ride something that actually the majority, of, the vast majority, right? Because we understand, as Michael said earlier, it's really important to point out that disciplinary boundaries are not static. And new work, some of the most viable new work is the ones that are challenging those boundaries. And so figuring out where that work is actually doing that kind of thing that's helping us progress with knowledge or become whatever your values are, become a more informed society, a more mm -hmm. just society um, versus when it's opportunism that's trying to create legitimation for ideas that don't have good evidence behind them or, a, or enough enough of their peers thinking that this is a legitimate path. Um, th so that's the one side. That we, you know, people complained about those tenured faculty who uh, have immunity, seemingly immunity, and have mm -hmm. no consequences for batshit ideas. People can claim that we're in a new moment where the John Eastman's of the world, with the Scott Atlas's of the world, 
real damage is being done by those people. Um, and and it, could, it could get worse. So there's that side. The other side is we've had 30 years of exploding the numbers of faculty who don't have the protections of academic mm -hmm. freedom, but kind of half pretending that they do by virtue of treating it like an individual, right? Talking about it like it's free speech. That's another kind of weird perverse incentive for conflating free speech and academic freedom because you don't have to then understand the structures by which you've earned a certain kind of uh, legitimacy to pursue even new ideas. It, and because we're not giving that opportunity and we're not creating that investment in new faculty, new generations of faculty, they have no protection except for the residue of the conflation of the residue of the idea and the, the degree to which their campuses have tenure and so still operate in a culture in which faculty are supposed to be able to pursue ideas and pursue classroom discourse without uh, any kind of outside interference trying to control for political or economic reasons. So, but we've gone so far off the rails on that, that the truth is mm -hmm. that too many people don't have that protection. And so you'll see an adjunct instructor get terminated because of uh, uh, angry alumni. And mm -hmm. so the academic freedom committees are actually going at two different problems. You can see, you can see the, and, and you can turn, you can look at it in terms of the tenured faculty to whom, for, with, for whom their disciplines would no longer in any way support what they're doing. And then the, the adjunct faculty who has every right to do whatever they did or whatever they were doing was, was within a kind of disciplinary competence and showed their fitness, not their unfitness, and yet they're being politically persecuted or whatever. Um, so, that, so we're looking to try to create, uh, rebuild an infrastructure. Our first book together was to try, it was about teaching intensive tenure tracks not to try to restrict research for some people, but to try to create the protections of tenure for people who are teaching off, who haven't gone through the kind of research, you know, the tenure's now kind of defaulted to the recruit for research kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So to try to expand who has access to tenure. That was the first book. The, sec the second book, that that's, didn't quite work, hasn't quite, it didn't quite take off. We haven't expanded tenure. Across. The contingency issue has only become more urgent. Mm -hmm. So this is another way of trying to create the protections of academic freedom, some institutional accountability to adjunct faculty for academic freedom, rather than simply a statement that says they have it, which has no teeth. So let's let's turn to that, um, the, the concept of academic freedom committees. So as I understand this from your work, you, what, what y'all are proposing is um, not a new type of work. You're very clear on that, that the work of sort of like adjudicating uh, discrimination cases, uh, uh, cases of extramural speech, like that's happening across uh, uh, across the U.S. At, uh, at institutions of higher ed, but not it's not being done through shared governance by faculty committees. Um, what? I, 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 the 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 obvious question is uh, why should we do this? But I think you've just answered that. Um, the, I think the harder question is everything's on fire. We're living in a state of like constant austerity in higher ed, especially public higher ed right now. Um, how can we make room for the work of taking on, um, these vital responsibilities for academics to be experts on academic freedom at their own institutions and to have a say in how the decisions are made? May I? Yeah. I want to go back and say I, the the two words that Jennifer didn't but uh, suffused everything she just said due process. Um, I was looking over various um, uh, pitches for faculty unionization, and one of them, I think, actually from our colleagues down the road here at University of Pittsburgh, said that tenure itself is a gentleman's agreement, not academic freedom, but tenure, and that's not true. Uh, tenure is a legally binding thing. It is continuous employment with termination for cause, and Jennifer and I have it, and the people mm -hmm. without it don't have that for cause part, and that is why tenure itself is not a, a gentleman's agreement, but academic freedom is, and the idea mm -hmm. contingent faculty have it is almost threadbare. Um, we have been promised uh, that at Penn State, um, if a non-tenure track faculty member is charged, whatever, the, the same process will be 
granted them as a tenure track faculty member, but there's no guarantee of that. That depends entirely on goodwill. That's what a gentleman's agreement is. So academic freedom committees. Uh, you leap immediately to the increased workload. I, I smile ruefully because for five years here when I was involved in the leadership of the faculty senate, one of the things we tried to do because we could not get a conversion to tenure plan at Penn State the way Jennifer and I were proposing, uh, instead we thought, all right, well, what can we get from the administration through the faculty senate? What we got was a, um, a promotion and review plan run by the non-tenure track faculty themselves. So they were not entirely beholden to individual administrators, department heads, division heads, whatever. Okay, but you know, for a while, um, what it meant was more review work for the non-tenure track faculty. Mm -hmm. How do we get mm -hmm. to review each other? And as I promised them, injustices will still be done. People who deserve a promotion will not get one. It happens. It, the only difference is that it's not an up or out decision, um, but it might still be you know extremely painful, but it creates more work. But here's what I would say about the more work involved in academic mm -hmm. freedom. One of the reasons that we have ceded so much ground to administration with regard to shared governance is precisely because of that overwork where we decide, okay, well, we'll just delegate everything involving. Um, now, granted, some of the things we should delegate, we don't want necessarily to involve in housing and dining policy. Uh, some of the things that I did on faculty senate extended to even to signage on campuses. Actually, that was crucial because of non-smoking. Eh, but you know what I mean? We're, uh, that's This is so central to what mm -hmm. we do that if we don't take it on, it will be done and is being done by offices of diversity, equity, inclusion, or human resources, or Title IX offices, or the dean, or the provost, many of whom you know, may have all the good intentions in the world, but this is a thing that involves faculty expertise and faculty self-governance. And as Jennifer, I think, suggested uh, the previous answer, uh, this is going to be the only shot for a lot of contingent faculty for anything like a, they don't have the legal due process mechanisms of tenure, but this would at least give contingent faculty a board of, of peers to appeal to if, in fact, they are charged with abusing their role as instructors, either in the classroom or extramurally. Let's let's shift to the extramural because I want to open up to Q and A for a couple sec for in, in, a, in a couple of minutes uh, and 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 hear from everybody here. But um, one of the things I note from your book is that uh, uh, so it, um, extramural speech is is sort of is included in a in a in a calculated way in the AAUP statement on academic freedom. Uh, a frequent category of extramural speech in recent years has been social media because of the ubiquity of social media in our culture and how it's really taken off. Um, Twitter, especially, I think, um, in, in high profile ways. Um, how, can you talk a little bit about how that is a space, especially where contingent faculty have um, seemed to be paying the largest consequences? Uh, we offer a couple examples in the book. I mean, are people with a, a Facebook post, one that was satirical and not understood that way, where, in fact, this is a, a, a adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The people who came after her were not donors and alumni, they were students. And, you know, the the pressure um, to fire this, this woman for a post that seemed to be supportive of sexual harassment in the armed forces, but was in fact born of bitter experience with mm -hmm. sexual harassment in the armed forces. And it was a comment on a uh, harassment case that literally turned lethal. Um, there too, you want people to slow down, right? Mm -hmm. Actually look in, we have an, our entire first chapter is about context. <laughs> it takes literature professors to do that. But in all seriousness, I mean, I, 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 this is one that I coined, but Jennifer, let, let me let me do it. Uh, Twitter as a decontextualization apparatus. It is so damn hard to establish the network of reference and intertextuality mm -hmm. to any random tweet, right? <clears throat> um, so that's part of the challenge, quite apart from the fact that some people tweet as if they're singing in the shower, as if, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's just like, and they have no idea what can go viral or why, right? 
So I think um, we also have, I mean, going back, going back to something earlier, Jennifer said, we're not really after free speech in this book, and we're not, but we do raise an eyebrow. I can't do it except by with, with a finger. Uh, say, look, you know, um, things actually have changed in the last 10, 15 years. Well, we got a, a reasonably hostile but informed review from Jonathan Marks in the, the Never Trumper outlet, The Bulwark, that said, oh, come on, you know, um, this has been the case since the invention of the printing press. And we were thinking, no, what's going on with Twitter and Facebook is qualitatively different from Benjamin Franklin printing up anonymous pamphlets and, you know, trolling his fellow citizens yep. in, in the service <laughs> of a, a republic. Um, this is this is not a question of degree. This is a question of kind. This is a difference in kind. And the fact that you now have an apparatus involving two billion people that can foment genocide really does uh, provoke. And, and we're seeing this unfold in real time with um, some guy who bought Twitter. <clears throat> Just how toxic uh, a place that was already a cesspool can can become. Mm -hmm. So when you add that to the fact that extramural speech has always been part of academic freedom in the United, in the United States, and that's not true elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> A lot of other traditions leave extramural, free, uh, extramural speech to the protection of the state. We consider it part of academic freedom, but it has a very tenuous and tangled relation. And yes, that's where a lot of the most um, incendiary uh, cases have come from. And a lot of them have involved contention faculty who can be fired on the basis of a tweet, whether or not it's read correctly or in context. Yeah, and one thing I'll add to that on, on under the um, the the musk of it all, uh, that I, I don't know if you've been uh, watching the the blue Twitter, the blue checkmark discourse recently, where uh, uh, a source of uh, joy, an absolute source of joy, uh, 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 Musk monetized the blue the blue checkmark policy, and the immediate response was that the trolls came out, impersonated corporations, and are in some cases dr reportedly driving down stock. Um, from, yeah, but from it's free now. Come on, there's an upside. <laughs> yeah. Say again. Like so, <clears throat> and Lockheed yeah, yeah. is not selling arms to the U.S. anymore because of human rights violations. That that was that actually took me back about 20 years to when in, in, to the early blogosphere when when trolls were fun. I I, I did enjoy it, but no, it also it also means anarchy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like I, I just it, to pull out your crystal ball. Uh, uh, but each of you, like, does, is Musk's takeover of Twitter just sort of like the new, the next step in sort of like the evolving social media scape? Or given how central Twitter has been to, I think, building academic communities in recent years, um, are, are we seeing, are, might we see like an evolution as people leave the platform, as it becomes unstable, et cetera? An evolution of what? Uh, the way the way we use social media, the way it interacts with um, uh, uh, the academy. I want to just mention one. I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that, or I certainly don't have a crystal ball. And I'm, I'm curious. Michael, mm -hmm. hold on to whatever it is you're thinking right now, because I want to hear it. But uh, there's one point that I do want to make mm -hmm. that has to do with your point about Twitter having become important to the building of academic careers and academic cultural capital and stuff, and mm -hmm. getting your work out, and then. Um, I do think that social media has raised a question that do, that we don't deal with directly in the book, in part because it it does raise questions of harm, which we did not go near. We went we went about the fitness. We were interested in, you know, people are tweeting stuff that's unfit or writing stuff that's unfit or writing stuff, or if they're trying to put forward for their promotion and tenure committees stuff that. Um, peer review can't support that it's not free you know all that that kind of that stuff and just reminding faculty that we do have some mechanisms both to create due process for contingent faculty and a whole tenured faculty accountable that was the idea but i do think that one of the things that does keep coming up with tweets from that are incendiary is the question of how does this affect the pedagogical experience, which is fundamentally different than the pre-social media world, because mm -hmm. if we all can be tweeting our thoughts on every last current event while we're simultaneously teaching 30, you know, 60, 80 students every couple of days, and they're, they could be, and it's all public, how does this affect their relationship to the classroom, their sense of belonging, you know, et cetera? 
I do think that that's become a real question. I mean, I see, and I, I, I'm on the left, so it's, I have a much higher threshold just naturally. I mean, I'm not saying like intellectually, but naturally to trying to look at and figure out what's satirical about various things or what, or the fact that a history of oppression makes certain kinds of a history of certain groups being oppressed means that certain tweets are going to read differently than um, a white. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm sensitive to all of that, but I'm also coming to feel like I, I see some tweets by some of the people who, the kind of people who were at that rogues gallery at Stanford conference, where I think I legitimately not sure that I would be graded fairly in that class as a woman. I legitimately, if I were, and I do think, you know, it, it, ch it challenges English professors who are really comfortable with the idea that passionate, you know, hyperbole, all of these things are part of what we do and part of social action. Mm -hmm. And and we have, but it, I do think that that's going to need to be part of the discourse. And I do think that this moment where we're saying, oh, look at the way in which um, the N word jumped, you know, by exponentially when Musk took over. I think that's helping us begin to have these conversations mm -hmm. about. And I think the fact that we could people could be moving to a different social platform that does more community moderation and is has different rules for engagement. These are all useful things that will then filter back to the academy in some way in terms of what are mm -hmm. our community uh, rules of engagement here? How do we talk mm -hmm. to one another? And so even though civility is not Michael and my go to in any way, because we're very sensitive to the way in which social movements have required a certain kind of passion and mm -hmm. uh, extreme uh, formulations. I think that we, we are going to go to community learning agreements and things, and mm -hmm. that will incorporate how for faculty use social media. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, um, I actually am on Twitter. Um, I used to say I use it every sunspot cycle. I may go back to that in, in the era of Musk, but I've got two things here. One, uh, a lot of what Jennifer just said was in play in the Stephen Salida incident eight years ago, mm -hmm. because even though Salida had no record whatsoever of alienating any students at Virginia Tech, the argument was was made that now that he was sort of notorious for tweets about Gaza and Israel's incursion in Gaza in, in 2014, uh, Jewish students would feel precisely as Jennifer said she might feel as a woman in some of the rogues gallery classrooms. Um, that I don't think, I mean, we still think the AAUP standard is worth upholding. Extramural speech has to bear directly on a faculty member's fitness to serve. And it rarely does. Nevertheless, that case was made, right? And I think mm -hmm. and this has been, this, this goes back to, again, my early days as a blogger where people worried about, well, um, the blogs didn't go as viral, but you had some celebrity bloggers who had, you know, mm -hmm. And hundreds of thousands of readers in the academy. I wasn't one of those. I was in the next couple of tiers down. But it was always a question of whether that extramural speech would have effects, sort of knockoff effects, on on classroom pedagogy. Um, as for you, Nicholas, you also uh, Nick also asked about mm -hmm. that sort of academic community, which I think I, I know mm -hmm. a little bit more about uh, than my co-author, only because not because I'm in one, but because I see um, younger scholars. Uh, not only off the tenure track, but graduate students building mm -hmm. kind of uh, discourse community on Twitter that they would not have elsewhere, and they certainly would not have had 30, 40 years ago. Uh, John Guillory gestures at this in his new book about uh, professionalism. I, I still think it's cold comfort. You don't have a tenure track job, but you have a Twitter community, right? <laughs> That's... Uh... Yeah, please that's quote gold. me. Yeah, um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, no, that that that's a perfect encapsulation. Keep going. Well, it kind of is. I mean, I I buried this. I, I just uh, wrote a, a very long review of, of of John's book, and you know, I, I I could write a review of just of his uh, take on graduate education over the last 20, 25 years. I, on the one hand, I think he's right. There are these Twitter communities. I've seen people post in the last couple of days. I don't know mm -hmm. what to do if I lose this. And Mastodon is not working out. And I love the suggestions I've seen from some, some of my colleagues saying, now's the time to revive blogs, right? In this context, going back to blogs looks like going back to like print encyclopedias. It's like, oh, yes, blogs, 800 words in a single post. I remember that. Um, and to go back to Jennifer's other point, you actually could curate a community on blogs. Mm -hmm. 
some blogs became famous for their readerships, for for their mm -hmm. for their comment sections. That um, where you to to coin a phrase. No, I think it's a word's worth. You create the taste by which you are to, to be enjoyed. Very hard mm -hmm. to do with a tweet. I've actually had in a legal context um, someone say, "Well, what about this tweet of yours where you said um, at least Hitler never inflicted Sean Spicer on his people." Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I didn't lose my job over that, but it was, uh, I said, you know, I have no idea what the hell I, oh, yeah, my what, what is the context there? Yeah. <laughs> the context is that Sean Spicer, for the six hours that he was the the uh, the press person in the White House under uh, the former guy, uh, had said at least, you know, Hitler never used poison gas on his people, which, you know, I mean, I kind of have a stake in that one. The T4 program targeted people with disabilities. Um, mm -hmm went first and i in order to keep my blood from boiling i tweeted something sardonically instead but again mm -hmm. that has to be established in the context of a welter of not only the original news story but other yeah, other tweets i don't know of anything I, I i don't know enough about the um infrastructure and the archaeology uh, the, the architecture of social media to know what could take twitter's place um <clears throat> like i say i haven't looked over at mastodon yet um, Substack is still sort of a, a niche thing. It's like it's mm -hmm. only, I, I think it'll eventually become like you know podcasts. But I really don't want to do a crystal ball here. I, 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 my crystal ball is a magic eight ball, and it just says ask again later. Uh, no, but I, I love I, one. I love I love being able to put people on the spot right this because your thoughts on contingency and community here I think are incredibly valuable. Like, yeah. Um, we don't know what the next step is. I mean, yeah. there's, nothing more, there's nothing more alienating and, and isolating than those periods after classes, right? From from comps and, and writing a dissertation, unless you have a writing group, unless you create a local community. And now people actually do have something else. They have a more yeah. lateral uh, discourse community uh, that I, I completely underestimate in Twitter at first. I used to think that about blogs as well. It was quite true that uh, some of the the spiciest and really most, um, early blog by the invisible adjunct, uh, somehow still relevant today, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but these these were raised for people who really didn't have, um, you know, who basically didn't have um, a standard uh, platform in, in referee journals uh, mm -hmm. to contribute to a different sort of lateral kind of, I wouldn't mm -hmm. call it a peer review, but I would call it a discourse community. All right, well, let's open up Q&A. So uh, we've got about 15 minutes left in the hour. I have upgraded everybody, or I, I will quickly hit the couple uh, folks I didn't hit. I've upgraded everybody to panelists, so you should be able to unmute, uh, uh, turn on cameras. Um, I'd encourage you to use the raise hands feature um, or put type questions in chat if you would prefer. I'm really happy that we were sponsored by, oh, good, there's a question, but I was really happy we were sponsored by both D Diversity Office and AUP. I love when those things can be brought together. So if there, I was just, that was basically a call for anyone who's coming from either of those places who might be here. I'd love to hear from you, but. Yeah, I, 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 Alberto, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because Alberto is, uh, Alberto is our director of the Diversity Center and he's new to campus, but Elliot had a hand first. So Elliot, go. Well, I'd rather go to Alberto because that might be more consistent, but I did want to ask um, a little more about how we as academics have really hurt ourselves with the corporate collusions. And um, there was reference to that, you know, the Atlas stuff in the pandemic, certainly Big Pharma, certainly Deepwater Horizon, and of course, way back to tobacco, right? And um, it, it seems like there was a lot of damage done then, and it, that still exists, and these new waves of kind of assaults on this have, have just added to that. But I wonder if you could comment on this ongoing um, and how, how we, we can't police it, but how we call that out in a way that is consistent with our values. Jennifer's got a great riff on this. What is it? Uh, you you got the tobacco guy. 
the blog, the academe. Well, we'll get into the climate change. The, 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 yeah, yeah. Name, but he's been he's been in the pay he's been in the pocket for quite some time. Right. Um. And I and I just was just racking my brains. I just saw something in the New York Times about another academic who is being exploited for some kind to sort of spread a certain narrative. And I don't know if it was around the small nuclear reactors or what what it was. But yeah, I don't I don't have a, a I don't remember what I said. But I have that's I think what right now Elliot all we seem to have are these petitions and these different groups that decide that they're going to focus on particular individuals or particular industries to try to get the exploitation the use of a sort of academic talking heads that don't actually have the backing of their disciplinary communities out of out of those discourses um and i think that the other way though the other way this conversation could get furthered is through the campaigns that we see for divestment from various things that universities shouldn't be in the business of in capitalizing on stuff that the majority of the academic community that has expertise in that field considers to be profoundly damaging to certain communities or to the planet or to whatever. Um, but I think that's a great question. And I think it doesn't, it could come up and it could be something that raises, do you have academic freedom to use your position do you have academic to use your position to make money through a think tank or from a corporation for public speaking fees to peddle information that is not widely validated by your um that I, I could see an academic freedom i could see someone being put forward to an academic freedom community with that being a question but yeah i don't i don't have any good i think more needs to be done for sure michael do you want to I'm you just, have any thoughts, and I'm just wondering if it was David Legates. I'm looking up uh, various people um, who are. I mean, and again, it's not like they uh, they were uh, duped and doped uh, by the petroleum industry or by anyone else. They they actually uh, do believe that climate change is not real. They're happy to get paid to say so. Um, but I think that's that's one um, that's one form of damage. I mean, we just scratched the surface with that in. Uh, chapter six by discussing Scott Atlas. Uh, if we we could have gone on for a whole nother thing about people who have been you know paid shills, um, and you know we do have a pretty capacious. Uh, we have a big tent in in our book for people hiding under the banner of controversial ideas. That you know, it is controversial. He you know he's just bucking the disciplinary orthodoxy that climate change is anthropogenic and actually happening before our eyes. Um, and it's really hard to get a handle on on how to get at that, right? Because um, merely saying you are refuted by ninety seven percent of your peers might just also catch you know some dolphins with the bad fish, right? Um, and we tried in that chapter to say, well, does this, when a person comes up for, for, for things that are, you know, absolutely toxic and, and this you know, literally damaging to the environment, um, what is the standard that should apply? We, we came up with various things having to do with democracy. We were writing in the shadow of an interest insurrection, but it's not clear that, that captures everything. And I'm not sure what does. Alberta? Thoughts from the, the 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 Plymouth State PSU University Center. Yeah, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you both and thank you, Nick, for organizing this program. And I mean, one of the th one of the things that was coming up for me as you both were sharing was sort of um, how thinking about contingent faculty, adjunct faculty, and how um, disproportionately those are people of color, often women, disabled folks, and so. Um, I was just thinking about that and sort of how, um, you know, things that could be, you know, not renewing one's contract for financial reasons. I know th those things have occurred on our campus and how those, you know, can disproportionately impact people of color, how that also lends to this idea of what you were talking about. And not this isn't the case for all people of color. Obviously, people of color, particularly or women of color, have scholarship in all arenas, but a, a lot of um, the scholarship of people of color does have to do with controversial topics. Um, and so I, I was just wondering if you might speak to that at all. 
Uh, one quick thing I can report uh, from the great state of Florida, uh, which in a lot of ways is taking the lead. I'm actually involved in, in a lawsuit um, involving, I think, maybe the 18th most evil law that passed in the last four years. And so it hasn't even hit the radar of, of, of our colleagues. But um, there is already a law on the books in Florida that not only um, uh, created the survey of intellectual diversity, on campus among faculty, students, and staff, but also uh, prevents student faculty from shielding shielding students from ideas. No one knows what the hell this means. And my initial reaction to it was, hi, Florida legislature, have you met the people trying to ban critical race theory because they're you? And I just thought, it's a long story as to how they managed to do the same thing. Uh, they were convinced partly by way of a really pernicious reading of the Chicago statement, where the university is not supposed to shield people from ideas. Um, I'm pretty sure Chicago did not think, that committee did not think, okay, now we're open to the lizard people. We don't wanna be shielding people or from the benefits of pedophilia. Um, I don't wanna be you know, shielding my students from a lecture on that. Well, <clears throat> um, the first people, uh, and this was, there was a chronicle story on this a, a couple months ago, the first people who uh, responded to the new atmosphere in Florida were faculty of color who basically said, yeah, the message is pretty clear. We should go elsewhere. Um, no one is going to have our backs, not our own administrations, certainly not our, our legislators in, in Tallahassee. Um, the, the divisive concepts uh, legislation, as you know perfectly well, is written so broadly as to cover pretty much anything touching on the history of race in the United States. And um, yeah, uh, there's, it, it doesn't actually say, you know, there's no way you can hold it up to the light and say we're going after the faculty of color first, but that's exactly how it is playing out. And I think that's a lot. And if you then cross cut that with the vulnerability of contingent faculty, I think you've got basically the, the very <laughs> the very point of your question that, um, you know, when I was asked, um, you know, where are the baleful effects of this legislation in Florida? Do we see an exodus yet in, in the one year that this law has been on the books? Um, I had to say, well, of course, still so too soon to tell, but you're asking the wrong person, right? You're asking a, a tenured white guy in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you should be talking to the faculty who either are completely changing their courses or folding the tent completely or trying to leave. And we will see plenty more of that. Um, and the question is how many places they will be to go. Right, because Florida will not. Florida is just, in so many ways, the sort of uh, leading edge. Uh, they're they're jockeying with Wisconsin and, and North Carolina and Idaho and other, a bunch of other places for who can create the most repressive intellectual environment above the K twelve level. Yeah, and if I could just add, when we wrote the book, the we were actually almost done with it when the anti when the divisive concepts legislation really became something that everyone was aware of and the anti-CRT stuff really exploded. We actually had started a chapter to talking about critical race theory, what, what we sort of owe to them and thinking about this right as it began to be demonized. Um, and I do think so, so right after we finished the book, I started working hard with a bunch of people on passing academic freedom Senate resolutions to protect that against the, these state legislations and to create solidarity among faculty for faculty who teach these the very concepts that are being targeted by this what I would call fascist legislation it's, a, it's at least authoritarian legislation in the sense that it's saying these partisan legislators can determine our curriculum um, whereas we have been for years hiring people to teach these very things and bring in and you know supposedly investing in them if they're tenure line or not investing them if they're contingent but either way, we've, we've been asking for these things to be taught. And now what are we going to do to defend them against this kind of legislation? I don't. So our book doesn't really have a direct answer for that, because in some ways it was written because the way that book publishing works and stuff, it was written before we were thinking about this and working on this. But I do think it's you were on to Chris Rufo before he was cool, before Christopher Rufo was cool. But, but literally, though, I do think that the impulse the book what the book argument does do is still the right track and is part of the same thing in terms of empowering according to aup and according to what has been the consensus for decades now in shared governance administrators have control over budget of course you know this is a very gray area between budgets and actual curriculum and, and how it plays out is very complex 
but over budgets and faculty have due to uh, prerogative of our curriculum. So this is something that directly impacts all of our academic freedom. And it's more, but the people who are on the firing line right now happen to be people who are teaching in women, ethnic studies, gender, the black studies, oftentimes disproportionately adjunct faculty, faculty of color, who by their very nature have been, by their very skin color has been politicized by this legislation and created a sense of, def of a, a certain kind of culture that can be capitalized on by a certain type of student. So it it is a shared government. Uh, to me, it's the Academic Freedom Committee is not enough to deal with that, but it is a faculty senate shared governance in a democratic society. Universities determine curriculum and have to, we have to come up with ways to protect. And, and I think there are faculty when we passed, when we got these Senate resolutions passed across the country, it was, I would sit in sometimes on the, through Zoom, because so much was happening through Zoom, of course, then. And it was kind of great because I would sit in on the faculty senators that I was talking to would say, hey, we're actually bringing the resolutions about we, you know, condemn this legislation. We call on our provost presidents to protect our instructors who do work in these areas, et cetera. We're actually voting on that in faculty senate, you know, next week. Do you want the Zoom invite? And I would go. And what was really cool is that you'd see uh, people put it out in terms of the anti-CRT and the divisive concepts. And then you'd see the biologists step up and say, um, you know, they're going to go after, and this was before Dobbs, they're going to go after my looking at reproductive care. They're, and then you'd see the people talking about, chem, the chemist person talking about chem, pollution and climate change. And so it's just starting to realize you, we all have a dog in this fight and we all need to protect one another. Well, and that's well, through shared governance. Uh, one little footnote to that. Yes, of course, the people teaching in controversial areas are on the firing line, as Jennifer says. But who we have lived so long now as to see classics and medieval studies be on that line as well. Uh, the yeah. faculty who are dealing with decolonizing medieval studies, um, Sarah Bond at Iowa, who was had the temerity to point out that the Greeks painted their statues and that white nationalists, for some reason, have a problem with this. Who knew they cared about art at all? But there you go. And so they came. The, the trolls came after Sarah Bond and the University of Iowa in response came up with a very good 14-page booklet about how to protect your faculty member from attacks by social media trolls. Point being, even before we get to biology and chemistry, it can come from anywhere. It can come from anywhere. And it has, and it will. So we're we're running short on time. Uh, I, I want to get to I want to give Paige Paradise the last question because Paige is the only person to use the Q and A function. Uh, uh, and and oh oh, uh, did you type it? Okay, yeah. Can, can, can we can we verbalize it for the recording? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, uh, sure. Paige, go ahead. Yeah. Go uh, ahead, Paige. So I'm actually the graduate assistant for the PSU of Plymouth State um, Diversity Center. But um, I guess like my question is like, what can I do as a student? Because like I've had professors in the past like say outlandish comments and then like immediate follow it by like, I've got tenured, like the school can't do anything. To which like kind of like feels like removes like my power in the situation or makes me feel lesser. And it's like, okay, can I even do anything like at that point? So like what can students do who like, I guess, feel like in lesser power about like kind of like situations like that or like- well, it ain't easy. Uh, it, it, it's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not an easy lift. Um, but if we're talking about outrageous things about how, well, let's take something that I, you know, care, uh, right in my bill of work. Um, you know, people with significant intellectual disabilities have nothing to contribute and should be warehoused, institutionalized, or killed. I got tenure. Nothing. No one can do anything about that. And that's that's actually not true. Tenure is not carte, carte blanche. Um, and Jennifer and I, very late in the writing process, uh, found the example of a professor. It was these people in the business school or in economics mouthing off about how the Jews control Hollywood and about how diversity is strangled. It, it, it's just, oh, no, it was race realism and with no expertise whatsoever in race or for that matter in realism. And they, there were student complaints. And, you know, a lot of times there are student complaints and, and nothing is done. That's why I say it's not an easy lift. One thing that needs to be done, if this is in fact a systemic 
and, and pervasive problem is numbers. Numbers of students coming forward and saying, you know what, this wasn't a one-off. This guy this one, didn't just go off about the Jews this one time. This is an obsession that actually derails the course, that actually does violate the AUP principle about teaching, that you know, material irrelevant to the class, that controversial material that has no relation to the class should not be persistently intruded into a discussion. So yeah, I, I hate to say, as I didn't, uh, type response, hey, this department has, there's deans, I hate to be pe appealing to authority, I hate to be calling in the police, but they're not the police, there are, there are peers, and as a matter of fact, um, you don't get to do whatever you want with tenure, but some tenured faculty think otherwise. There are cases, I'll take one more, where I don't have, I, I can go ahead and misgender my students, because I have academic freedom. Really? No, you're in violation of a Penn State policy, and we got to talk about this. So again, it's it's not because again what tenure legally means that due process that's there means there it has, people have to be fired for cause and that's a pretty high bar, but it it does it does happen, or if they're not fired at least um, disciplined or spoken to or dealt with in some way, um, and the, the case of the misgendering um, that involved uh, someone. <clears throat> being taken off certain committees, no longer having a joint appointment with uh, certain departments, stuff like that. Uh, there are things short of uh, stripping of tenure that are still available. But again, you're talking about invoking a disciplinary apparatus that sometimes could go the wrong way, right? And also maybe involving yourself uh, and other students in a, in a struggle that may not actually have come to fruition, but there are, there are evidence and there are, um, there are legitimate uh, outlets for complaints like that. There's something that I would want to just add to that that I see as something that should be on the table in the, over the next five to ten years, which is really we. I do think we are at a kind of inflection point in our culture. For example, where these questions of I it, you're violating my academic freedom if you tell me I can't misgender a student. Like there's these weird places, right? where we need to bring DEI and Faculty Senate together. And there's going to be some hard arguments around that, right? There's going to be some battles. But we can't, there, there is a problem with simply saying, let the faculty deal with it, because too many of them are not, haven't thought about these issues in the way that DEI professionals have, and have not dealt on the ground with these issues and see the harm to students, et cetera. So there's going to have to be a lot more collaboration. They're, they're on two separate tracks way too much right now. And I think that there would actually be, there's actually much more support between each other than is realized because the cases that come up when they're on the two different tracks, all we see is the budding and the conflicts. So I would say that it, you're a graduate student, Paige. So you'll be a faculty and as a graduate student, you can be part of the conversation that brings, for example, a faculty senate saying, working with DEI professionals to say it is our policy that misgendering students is a form of disrespect that can't be seen as fitness within best practice, best pedagogical practices. I think universities, and what's kind of both disheartening and heartening about it is that it is going to have to happen on a number of different campuses and then that will sort of spread and get modeled on others. Mm -hmm. But it, no one person can, no one entity, no one body, not the government, the government's trying to interfere in ways that are incredibly horrible for the most part. Um, no one entity can force these through. It's going to have to start happening with people collaborating on campuses and then that spreading and these policies becoming more the norm. Other other faculty and graduate students hearing about, oh, well, that's campus passed this policy, pa pa policy that the DEI office agrees with, but the faculty senate hadn't yet weighed in on and now they have. And just creating the infrastructure to hold these faculty accountable. Um, but yeah, the DEI and faculty senate, some of the stuff that we've learned through that the professionals in DEI have learned, some of the people who do black studies, women's studies, et cetera, but who that all has to come into faculty senate and, and help inform the decisions there in my mind. Well, we're over time. I think on that uh, excellent summation, we should thank Jennifer and Michael for joining us tonight. I really think you all have kicked off conversations at the New Hampshire PSU that <laughs> are, are really important, um, uh, that, that have been happening, happening in scattered ways, I think with a lot of us on this call, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's the direction we need to head into is doing this work. So I really appreciate you joining us tonight for this. Thank you, everyone, for showing up, and thank you for organizing it, Nick. Yeah. Thank you from another snowy part of the country that just got hit yesterday. 
All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy y'all's November, and we'll be in touch. Same. Be well. Bye.